Hello, my name is Eric Tan. I'm assistant professor at the University of Southern California. Today I'm going to uh, present a case series of patients using the Arthrix, Dianite, and all staples for traumatic nonunions. So first we have to figure out, one, what are nonunions and why do they occur? A nonunion is where a bone doesn't heal. So in a situation where you have a fracture or in a situation where you've done surgery and you've cut the bone, when these bones don't heal, usually in a time frame of three to six months, we call that a nonunion. And we have to understand how do these occur? Well, fracture healing depends on a complex interplay of two factors. One is mechanical stability and two is biological potential. So when you have an issue with one or both of these factors, this is what leads to non-healing or non-uniting of the fracture. And this subsequently causes pain and dysfunction to patients. In this case, we're gonna present the use of the Arthrex Dianite Nitinol staples. There are certain factors and properties of these staples that make them unique and helpful for this complex situation. One, they have continuous compression. So in this situation where you want increased stability, the continuous compression of the staple provides that. In addition, it has a low profile. So if you want to supplement this with an additional plate, additional screws, you have more real estate to do so. In addition, there's also multiple sizes. So these range from small sizes such as nine by seven millimeters all the way to 25 by 20 millimeters. Finally, they're easy to apply, they're easy to deploy, and also if you need to take them out or revise them, you can reload them and reuse them. And all of these are very helpful in these situations where you may have limited real estate uh, in order to create this healing potential. So this is a case of a patient with hallux valgus and metatarsal nonunions. She was a 64-year-old female with left foot pain. She has a three-year history of surgeries to the left foot for hallux valgus deformities and hammer toe deformities. Her most recent surgery performed at an outside facility included a revision left first tarsal metatarsal joint fusion, extensor halsus longus lengthening, second metatarsal phalangeal joint fusion, placement of intercalary grafts between the joints for fusion, as well as uh, augment allografts. However, despite the surgery, she continued to have chronic pain, developed non-unions, and had an inability to weight bear. Here were her radiographs on presentation. We can see that with regards to the first tarsal metatarsal joint, we can see that the proximal portion of the graft appeared to integrate. However, the distal portion of the interposed graft still seemed like it wasn't demonstrating healing. We can see from the broken hardware as well uh, that this indicates that there was mechanical instability at the fusion site from the non-healing. In addition, at the second metatarsal phalangeal joint, we can see that there's a joint line still visualized despite the fusion procedure. In addition, the broken instrumentation, again, demonstrates a lack of mechanical stability to the site. Here's a CT scan, and we can again confirm the non-unions, both at the first tarsal metatarsal joint, as well as the second metatarsal phalangeal joint. And in this case, we elected to, one, for the first tarsal metatarsal joint, we elected to perform a revision fusion for that site in order to really get that site solid. And then for the second, metatarsal phalangeal joint, we felt that most of her pain was coming from the fact that it was actually attempted to be fused, so we elected to take down that fusion, and we'll discuss that shortly. So for the first tarsal metatarsal joint, what we did was we first, again, identified and prepared the sites. We made sure we removed any interposing fibrous tissue. We reprepared the bony surfaces in uh, exposing good, healthy cancellous bone, and then we provided first manual compression. Then we supplemented this with two Arthrex Dynanite Nitinol staples, and this allowed us additional real estate to provide a headless compression screw as well as our plantar lapidus plate. Again, this biomechanical stability that we wanted to produce was important because she'd had multiple surgeries for this, so we wanted to make sure that we really provided a solid base for healing. Distally, we did uh, correct her residual hallux valgus uh, deformity with the placement of a nitinol staple for an Aiken osteotomy. And then from the biological perspective, we supplemented this with concentrated iliac crest bone marrow aspirate in addition to arthrocell allograft. From the second metatarsal phalangeal joint, we removed the hardware, we took down the non-union and fusion site, we re-prepared the second metatarsal phalangeal joint using a cup and cone reamer, and then placed an Arthroflex dermal allograft as a protective barrier on the second metatarsal head to re-establish motion at that site. Here are immediate post-operative radiographs demonstrating the instrumentation and the procedure. She was kept non-weight bearing for two months and then subsequently advanced. Here at three months, we can see good healing across the first tarsal metatarsal joint and evidence of fusion, maintenance, maintenance of the correction of her hallux valgus alignment. In addition, she still had demonstrable motion at the second metatarsal phalangeal joint, reducing her pain. 
So in conclusion, non-union surgery requires addressing both of the major factors, mechanical stability as well as biological potential. We need both of these in order to have a successful result and a successful fusion. In addition, in this presentation, we're demonstrating the use of the dianite nitinol staples, which provide a low profile continuous compression, which are ideal for situations like these with potentially limited bone and healing. Thank you.